This show is listener supported. You can join us and help our show grow to support more adoptees by going to adoptezon.com slash partner. You are listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. This is episode 100, Reshma. I'm your host, Haley Radke. Here we are, 100 episodes. I am just bursting. I'm so happy. I did not expect ever to make 100 episodes of the podcast. And I'm just so honored that you would take the time to listen every week and for my guests to be so vulnerable and candid with their stories and opening their hearts to us. It is truly an honor to work on this show and bring these stories to you. I hope you are finding them helpful. I hear from adoptees multiple times a week telling me the show has changed their life. I've heard from adoptees who say their marriage has been saved. I've heard from um, one adoptee who was contemplating taking her life um, until she found the show and felt that she wasn't alone And so the impact Adoptees On has been having in the world is absolutely so much bigger than I could have ever hoped or dreamed of. So I want to dedicate this show to all of my guests that have shared with us so freely and all of my listeners who know now that they're not alone and to my faithful monthly supporters, without which I would not be able to bring you this show every single week. So thank you so much. It's truly an honor to get to speak to you this way, and I don't take it lightly or for granted, I promise. Today, my dear friend, Reshma McClintock, creator of Dear Adoption, producer, co-director, and subject of the documentary, Calcutta is My Mother, is here to share her story and celebrate 100 episodes with us. I asked Reshma to be the guest today because she is so passionate about the same thing I am, adoptee voices. Today, Resh shares what shifted her view of adoption, what it's like for her to talk about India and adoption with her daughter, and the paradox of navigating cultural appropriation for a transracially adopted person. We even do a little time travel today through the magic of podcast editing. So you are going to hear my interview with Reshma before her documentary premieres and right after to fully experience it with her. At the end of the show, I'm going to let you know a couple ways you can connect with Resh and I in person coming up very soon. And if you listen to the very, very end, my kids have a little message as well. As always, we wrap up with recommended resources. You can find links to everything we talk about on adoptezon.com. So let's do it for the 100th time. <laughs> let's listen in. I'm so pleased to welcome to Adoptees On, Reshma McClintock. Welcome, Reshma. Hi, Haley. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited. It's been such a long time since you were on the show because you were. We recorded in person a little, um, it was at a conference at the uh, Concerned United Birth Parents Conference, uh, retreat, I should say. And you talked to us a little bit about your adoption and why you started it. But I'm really excited because you have big stuff coming up this year. And I wanted people to get a chance to know you a little bit better. Um, So yeah, this is so fun. Why don't you start out and share um, a piece of your story with us? Absolutely. I was born in Calcutta, India in 1980. And I was adopted out of Calcutta at the age of three months old. So I arrived in Portland, Oregon when I was three months. Um, I weighed just shy of seven pounds and um, basically, you know, came to start my new life. I, my parents had a biological son, my older brother, Tyler, and he was four at the time that um, I came over. And then um, about six years later, my parents adopted domestically. My younger brother, Simeon, was adopted. And so there's three of us in my family. And, you know, I had a really wonderful upbringing frankly, an idyllic childhood. My 
parents and I were very close. My brothers and I were very close and, and still to this day, uh, as far as family connectedness, I never struggled in that area. I always felt deeply connected and really just valued our time together. And yeah, so we, uh, I grew up in a conservative Christian home and we talked a lot about adoption, uh, partially because, you know, two of the three children were adopted and we kind of, my brother used to tease, he was actually the odd man out um, because he was biological to my parents and he used to kind of, you know, feel like the one that wasn't special, which is a really interesting, you know, conversation. I've heard that brought up on your show before about the sibling who wasn't adopted. So I, yeah, I had a really wonderful, really warm childhood and upbringing. As far as thinking about adoption growing up, I felt really, I don't know, in a sense, it was this this kind of obscure thing that I didn't fully embrace or understand, although I didn't realize at the time that I didn't understand it. Um, as an adult, I can see that I did have grief because of the separation uh, from my family, my biological family, and the separation from my culture and my country. I did have grief, but it manifested in really obscure ways and not obvious ways. My parents really tried to present opportunities for me to embrace my Indian culture, and, and it used to just make me really upset. And as a child, I couldn't articulate the reasons why it made me upset because I felt so distant from my culture. Um, And it was a scary thing to embrace. But really, I I felt like a white person. I I still do. I have this huge identity crisis as a transracial adoptee. And I I struggle with being Indian and how Indian I am. And, um, you know, because those roots were severed for me. So while I have this incredible family infrastructure that I know not a lot of people, let alone adopted people have. I also have all these loose ends that I feel the older I get, uh, you know, rapidly fray. So I think that when I meet children who are, you know, I, I mean, under the age of 15 who are adopted and they are kind of grappling with grief and are able to articulate some of their grief. I I really kind of envy them. And I tease that, you know, at nearly 40, I'm kind of at the same stage as as a 10 year old, (laughs) you know, and some of that is just because they have the, you know, I feel like the parents have better resources than, Mm -hmm. than my generation did. And, um, and so adoptive parents in some ways have, have come, you know, a really long way as far as understanding and recognizing the grief caused through adoption, caused from adoption. And, and then I think, you know, as a society, and, I, you know, there's a asterisk next to this, but we, we've come a long way in just accepting grief in general and being able to process things more openly. So adopted children of this generation, uh, it seems, are frequently more able to express kind of their grief and it manifests in, in more obvious ways because they, are, they have the language. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't have that. I didn't, we didn't ever talk about what I lost. Mm -hmm. We talked about what I gained. And, you know, I don't hold any hard feelings about my parents or my pastors or, you know, growing up about that, because I I understand, I understand that. But I think, you know, if, if something could have been done differently, I would say it would have been important for us to talk about the things that I lost and, and, and uh, to have space for me to be able to grieve those things. Because like I said, as a 40 year old, I sit with a 10 year old, who shares and expresses their grief with me. And I mean, it makes me really emotional just to think about, but, you know, I feel at that same space and I'm a wife and a mother and a grown up, but I feel very <laughs> infantile in some sense when mm-hmm. we talk about adoption. Well, I remember very clearly, you're the first transracial adoptee to ever say this to me. You said, often when I look in the mirror, I'm expecting to see a white face, like looking back. Yes. And, and, and I, I've, I've told that to multiple people because that's just like your sense of identity is so like, I, I don't even know what word to use that, but, um, and wrapped up in the grief and, and all that piece, it's encouraging to know that there is that young people are talking about that now, but also like, it's so frustrating to me that, you know, we didn't have that understanding for you at the time. I don't know. Can you talk about that? Like, I just, I don't have words for that because I don't, 
I don't understand the transracial experience. I know it's just a whole extra layer on top mm-hmm. of adoptee stuff. Right. Yeah, it is. It, it, I've said that really frequently that when I look in the mirror, I see, I see myself, but I don't see, well, now it sounds like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth because <laughs> I see myself. I, I believe my mirrors are working and, and giving me the, the proper image, but it's, it's still difficult for me to see myself as an Indian woman. And I don't know what an Indian woman feels like. I don't know what it feels like to be and feel Indian in a way that is, I I don't know, inherent, right? Because when I left Calcutta, and I didn't realize this at the time, and and I don't think my parents realized this. I I frankly don't believe the adoption industry realized this at the time. All of that was, was left behind. And it's like taking on a new identity. And so we talk a lot about, and I've heard a lot on your show, Um, from guests that we talk a lot about how adoptees are so adaptable, right? We kind of feel like we have to have this chameleon type personality and we can adapt and adjust to whatever environment we're in. And what's sort of ironic about that is probably a lot of us aren't really very good at that, but we think we are. (laughs) You know, we, we try, we put a lot of effort into people pleasing or, or we kind of do the opposite. And we are wallflowers, right? We kind of just blend into the scenery. So um, I think growing up for me, I did the opposite. I stepped out. I'm really your classic, you know, I really, I don't love stereotyping, but you know, there's stereotypes for a reason, right? I'm, I'm your classic, uh, you know, performing adoptee and, you know, earning my keep. And while I didn't feel that my place in my home would be threatened if I didn't perform, I received a really good response when I did. And so I wanted to be the best at everything. And I had a couple of talents here or there, you know, once upon a time. And so I really played on those. But the only thing really that I, I kind of identified with as far as being Indian is the, the reaction and the, that I, the reaction I got from people um, was that, you know, I was exotic, right? And so that's typically the word. And, you know, it's really fetishizing in some sense, not, not necessarily sexually, right? Um, you know, I definitely am not implying that, but, you know, that I was exotic and different looking. So I could kind of embrace that in a way. And anybody likes a compliment, right? So people would, were, you know, telling me I was beautiful or different looking or unique looking. And I'm not saying this with any arrogance, trust me, but that was something that helped me stand out, but it didn't cross all the way over into me feeling like I was Indian and that that was significant. So another part of that layer of that for me too, is that so much of Indian culture is really based in religion. And it's based in a religion that I don't practice. And um, so the bulk of India, I believe is, you know, Hindu. And I am you know, really respectful of that culture and that religion of all religions. But I grew up as a Christian, and I'm still a Christian person. And I wonder too, if apart from this physical identity of being an Indian person, also my religion and those kinds of things, it all makes me feel white. Mm. And um, I've said this a few times, and but when I see an Indian woman walking toward me, I cannot comprehend that she also sees an Indian woman walking toward her or, or anyone. I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be an Indian woman walking toward me, but I see an Indian woman and I think, oh, there's an Indian woman and, you know, something tugs at me or something happens in me. Sometimes I feel irritated, frankly, because I'm envious of her because I'm assuming, I don't know her background as she's walking toward me through the mall or down the street or whatever it is, but I assume she's more connected to being Indian than I am because I feel so disconnected from that. So I kind of tend to overcompensate in some sense, my Indianness as as I tend to call it, where I, you know, I started wearing a bindi a couple of years ago, every once in a while, just from time to time, a bindi is, a, you know, a sticker or makeup that you put on the center of your forehead, kind of between your eyebrows. And it's, uh, you know, a really significant piece of Indian culture, uh, more specifically for uh, the Hindu religion. And, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a practicing Hindu. And so I struggled with, you know, cultural appropriation. And then I wondered, But if I were a real Indian and had grown up in India and not as a Hindu, would I feel more comfortable 
where I, would it be okay then? Is it not okay because I grew up with white people? Or is it not okay because I'm not that religion? Or is it okay because I'm Indian and that's enough? I want to I want to ask, pause you here because I want to talk to you about your documentary. And um, we're talking right before you have your world premiere. So the first time anyone else has gotten to see it. And um, so we're not going to do any spoilers because we want you to go and see it. But can you talk to us about how that came about? And I imagine this theme has had led you to to this going back to Calcutta and what that was like. Yeah, I am 10 days from the premiere of Calcutta as my mother. And so you can imagine <laughs> the <laughs> nerves and just the excitement, anticipation. I'm feeling all the feelings, but um, but mostly good. I mean, this is a really exciting time and it's a privilege that not everybody has to share their story on this kind of a platform. So I'm really excited about it. Um, Calcutta is my mother started when Michael Herzl, he is a friend of mine from high school. I went to high school in Portland and we were Facebook friends. We hadn't, you know, spoken directly in, I don't know, almost 17 years, I think, by the time that we really connected on Facebook. We graduated in 1998 and then he moved to Dallas. I moved to Denver and we were friends on Facebook and kind of saw each other from time to time, but didn't really, you know, connect beyond that. And he went on a trip to India with his best friend, another friend that we went to high school with. And when he came back from the trip, he sent me an email and just said, you know, he was having a hard time processing some of what he saw. India is, you know, incredible. It is a beautiful, incredible place with incredible people. Uh, but it's it's tough. Uh, there's some tough things that we as Americans are not familiar with. And so you see some things and experience some things that are a shock to your system emotionally and, uh, you know, obviously physically as well. So he had just reached out and said, you know, do you, I know you have been to India. Do you have any suggestions for pro me processing this as I, you know, kind of come back into my, settle back into my American life? And I said, no, <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't really have anything to offer him. I just said, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to go to India and take in, uh, take it all in. And then it's a lot to process. You had already been back to India? I had been to India, but never to Calcutta. And okay. so um, it wasn't my first time in India. It was just, and I'm, I'm really happy about that. Years ago, I had hoped that my first time back to India would be home for me, would be Calcutta. And I'm actually, I'm actually glad that I kind of had the opportunity to experience India on its own, which was emotional in its own way, of course, but without going home and having that kind of added layer of emotions and just that, that part of the experience. I'm glad that happened in two phases, frankly. Mm -hmm. So Michael and I just kind of started chatting and I had just started writing about adoption um, publicly. I didn't know it at the time, but I had just started, you know, crawling out of the fog. I had some, a little bit of curiosity is really what peaked the whole thing for me. Um, I started wondering about, well, I had a daughter. And she was my first biological relative that I could ever know or see or touch. And, you know, I thought that would be the only biological relative I would ever know or see or touch. And it was just uh, kind of adopted people. We, we share this when we are able to have biological children. It's kind of mind blowing. You know, it's this, you know, having a child is an incredible thing anyway. And when you're adopted, that's your first biological relative. It's just, I don't, I mean, there really aren't words to describe it. So Anyway, it all came down to a Facebook message from Michael after we were talking about it. And he said, hey, what would you think about going back to Calcutta for the first time and us, you know, filming a documentary about it? And I, at the time, I don't think I really thought we would do it. So I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, when somebody asks you to do something scary and you don't really think you're going to have to do it, you just say yes. And, you know, you <laughs> imagine it will peter out and go away someday. But yeah, Michael, you know, had done some filming, um, but nothing on this level. Uh, he has a real talent and a real gift for it. Not only that, Michael and I are very similar in our personalities. And so uh, he was able to really draw some, some things out of me and help me process my uh, 
uh, crawling out of the fog in, in an incredible way. And he's not an adopted person and he's not a person of color, but he had some just real insight that um, not everybody could have, mm-hmm. but he really understood me. So we basically just started, Michael um, put a campaign together and raised the money on Kickstarter to film. We interviewed people uh, for our crew online. We just did FaceTime. We interviewed people all over the country. And um, we found uh, Jeffrey Alexander was our, was our director of photography and Sherry Vance was our sound technician. And um, they did you know really good work. So we uh, left for Calcutta in, at the end of May of 2015. And we were there on, we were there for I think, uh, seven, about 17 days. And we were there on the 35th anniversary of the day I left, which was really significant for me. So I actually went to the place where I was born, uh, likely born on that anniversary. And it was a really heavy day. And it's one of the best and one of my least favorite parts of the film is capturing that day because there was just so much going on internally for me. Um, The whole process, again, without giving any spoiler alerts, uh, which is hard to do, the whole experience was really, really difficult. And I um, had begun kind of navigating a little bit of grief. And it was like I stepped off that plane in Calcutta. It's hard to even think about, but and, and, and the floodgates opened. It was like being ripped open. And I wasn't prepared for that. And to navigate that, while being filmed was difficult, although, you know, I'm really grateful for it because, again, it, it's a privilege. Not everybody gets to do that. And so Michael, you know, isn't a therapist, but he kind of was mine in a <laughs> sense. You know, every day we would sit and we'd set up an interview um, in the hotel room or outside the hotel, and he would just ask me questions about how I felt. And it was really helpful. Uh, it was not easy. But it was really, really helpful. And I really went in. I, I, I really went all in. I, you know, can be really insecure. And but I just I knew that I didn't want to do this. If I wasn't going to say everything, I wasn't going to do it. And so I made a really conscious decision to just say everything. And I did. I said all the things. And, you know, seeing that all compiled in a film is I think incredible, you know, I've said the thing I love about the film is it captures my unfogging in real time. I'm still unfogging, right? It's, it's an ongoing thing. I don't know that we ever really reach the end of it, but um, I am still coming out of the fog in some ways, but it is, you know, this snapshot of a transracial adoptee and a search to connect to culture, which is really why I went. And you, the film starts kind of in those, when I'm first just kind of dipping my toes in and saying, all I want is to connect to my culture. I don't need to find my people. I don't need to know any information. I just want to connect to my culture. I just want to understand. And now when I watch that, it's kind of laughable. I mean, it's, mm. it's not funny probably to the viewer, but it's so funny to me how far I've kind of come from that space. But isn't that like you're protecting yourself? Like that's a, that's a safe first step into looking deeper into where you came from. Right. It is. And, you know, I th- I'm really glad you said that because, you know, very well, adoption spaces online are, are really, really tough spaces. Um, there is a lot. There are a lot of opinions. There's heavily fogged adoptees. There's heavily unfogged adoptees. There's some people kind of in the middle. And, you know, there's people at all these different stages coming together, trying to have a co- productive conversation about adoption. And most of the time it just doesn't go anywhere. It feels very frustrating. People get angry. People say nasty things. Someone ends up crying, someone ends up blocking. It's just kind of, you know, it's like, I don't know, high school. It's terrible. <laughs> so, but I, and I've been criticized for this, but uh, I still stand really firmly on it and may change someday. But as of today, I still really stand in this place that I really believe all adopted people should freely be allowed to share. And I don't, I really, for the most part, don't think that it is ultimately damaging to what what the mission is, right? Like, you know, for you and I, we really, we've come out of the fog and we have this heart to elevate adoptee voices, to shed some light on what it's really like to be adopted, to reposition adoptees as the most valued resource and voice in adoption. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of, I, I wrote something the other day and said, you know, we need to really reclaim our place as the most valued resource because it's shifted to the industry people and to adoptive parents. 
And I think first, it should be adopted people. And second, it should be uh, first families. And I feel really strongly about that. But I've been criticized for, I don't know, I, I had somebody tell me once, pick a lane. You know, you, are you for fogged adoptees or are you for unfogged adoptees? And I've just said all along, I'm for adoptees. I'm for adoptees who are heavily fogged and um, for them say that it was the best thing that ever happened to them. I'm for adoptees who say it saved their life. I'm for adoptees who say it ruined their life. I'm for adoptees who think it is absolutely wrong and should never happen again. I'm for adoptees who still see some redeeming qualities in adoption. And I'll tell you why. For me, if I had never started writing while I was in the fog, I never would have gotten to this place. And so when even a fogged adoptee, now I'm not saying it doesn't irritate me, you know, (laughs) when I see something online and someone says, oh, you know, an adopted person says, it's the most beautiful thing, the most wonderful thing. I'm like thinking, "Uh uh-huh. You know, I, I roll my eyes. I just like everyone else wish there was a, you know, eye roll option on Facebook and, you know, all of that. It, it, it frustrates me. And, you know, I have my own judgments I make, which is frankly what they are. It's none of my business how somebody else feels about it. I don't feel like it's setting us back, though. I just don't. I think that, you know, the conversations are going to happen. We're never all going to agree. But if I had not been, I don't know, allowed, if that's the right word, if I had not uh, began writing about adoption while I was still heavily fogged, I wouldn't now be writing about the adoption truth that I've since discovered. Mm -hmm. And so it was a part of my process. So while I might be irritated at someone who is uh, heavily fogged or more fogged than me, or someone who's in exactly the place that I once was, where I would have said, adoption is all good all the time. How could it be bad? You know, at one point, I'm sure I said that sentence and it makes me <clears throat> cringe a little, but, um, you know, I might cringe at those things, but I still stand by that each adopted person, no matter where they are in their journey, in their path, gets to say what they want to say mm-hmm. and that we should listen. And I don't always like the way people say things either. You know, people can be mean, um, but you know, my, my, my scale may be different. What What's mean to me may not be considered mean by someone else. And, you know, what's gentle by someone might not be considered gentle by someone else. So I, I really stand firm in that. And so there are, you know, the film begins and there's a couple of things I say, I mean, really like in the first couple of minutes of the film and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm going to be kicked out of every adoptee group on Facebook. <laughs> you know, people are going to start disowning me left and right. But, but, you know, it's where it began for me. Mm-hmm. And it was self-protection. You could not be more right. It's mm-hmm. how I protected myself. Um, It's how I felt like I needed society's permission to start talking about adoption. And in order to do that, I had to do it under the cloak of, but don't worry, I'm really, really grateful to have been adopted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I, I get it because I do think you're right. We all kind of start there, um, don't we? And um, having to think about it and actually going to a a place where you're speaking out publicly or writing publicly, that's the easiest place to start because then you don't get the pushback. (laughs) Right. And and you don't, you know, likely, like when I started blogging, yeah, I was pretty in the fog too. (laughs) Isn't it funny to go back and read those? I mean, that's why I don't link to it. Like, (laughs) I don't talk about what it was called. (laughs) Hopefully people don't look for it. Um, but you know, we, we do have to start somewhere. Okay. Right. Documentary, no spoilers. Let's talk about post documentary. So post filming, you come back and you've had this cracked wide open for you and, um, you started your adoption. You, and you're like an adoptee land, you know, so you've got all this yes. stuff happening. What does that look like for you now on the other side or in the middle, I guess, of the fog? (laughs) Not in the middle, but like going towards the end. Well, one of the things that really, I think, catapulted me out of the fog was the process of asking for support for the documentary. When we first kind of kicked things off. Now, again, the trailer that Michael created and used for the campaign to raise the money for the documentary it, it is pretty, most of what I say is pretty fogged adoptee. Um, I said, I just want to connect to my culture. I just need to know where I came from and how I came to be. And, you know, I just need India, right? I just need Calcutta. 
and then the title of the film, Calcutta is my mother. That's, that's where it came out of a conversation that Michael and I were having. And I said, you know, I can never get to my Indian mother. And so for me, Calcutta is my mother. It's as close as I can get to my roots is to go back to the place where it all began. Well, the outpouring of love and support for me was unbelievable when the campaign launched. My family and friends, of course, are, were incredibly supportive. My, my parents and my brothers, uh, obviously, you know, my husband and my extended family were really, really supportive. Um, there was a couple people here and there that were like, I, I just don't really get why you need to do that. But, you know, I think it's cool. That's fine. That's fair. And, you know, those people kind of still stand in that place, I, I've noticed. <laughs> But, you know, and it's okay. You, you know what you can expect from certain people. And, uh, you know, that sometimes that's as long as you know, that's you can manage that. But in general, from adoptive parents and um, even some agency people, you know, people came out of the woodwork and, and supported me and I was blown away. Well, as that support was rushing in, I started getting friend requests on Facebook um, from fellow adoptees, primarily transracial adoptees, but domestic, uh, you know, American adoptees as well. And I, my inbox was just inundated with emails from adopted people. And some of them were just saying, this is so cool. Uh, You know, I wish I could do something like this or thanks for being brave, which I wasn't brave, but you know, they were thanking me for that anyway. And the bulk of them, however, um, were coming from adopted people saying, I can't believe how much support you've gotten. This is amazing nobody will listen to me. And those kept pouring in and pouring in and pouring in. And, you know, I found myself, you know, staying up until three in the morning, emailing with adopted people and trying to remember that I'm not a therapist and and I'm not qualified to be, you know, counseling adopted people, but they just wanted to share. They just wanted space. And so I wasn't advising anyone um, because I'm not equipped to do so. I was trying to find resources for adopted people and send them that way. But I was so new to adoption land. I didn't really know what was out there. Uh, I didn't know that we needed to go to an adoptee or adoption apt therapist. I didn't know that, you know, and I think Anne Heffern has said that, you know, when you go to a therapist who isn't, you know, doesn't understand adoption. Well, I I frankly think we should all be going to adoptee therapists is I think maybe ideal, but you know, in a, a therapist who doesn't really understand and acknowledge adoption, trauma, and grief, and, and what it is like for an adopted person, it's like going to someone who speaks a different language. Mm-hmm. And so, and you know, has often talked about, you know, these years of therapy that really mean nothing because it was, it, it just, it, you know, they didn't understand where she was coming from and what the really the root of everything was for her. So I was really struggling to help people and feeling like I needed to do that. And I think at one point I, I I'd gotten to like, 516 emails that I had from adopted people just in the first like two months um, of all of this. So this is before I went to Calcutta. And I just, I was so mad. I was so mad because I was talking to people. I started talking to some people on the phone and they were just sobbing and pouring out to me. My family won't listen to me. Nobody understands that I need to connect to my culture. Uh, Nobody, you know, everybody thinks I'm just being ungrateful Everybody thinks that I'm just angry and maybe I am angry, but mostly I just am so confused about how I feel because I've been told to be grateful my whole life. And it feels like I'm not being grateful if I want to connect to my culture or if I want to find my family. And you know what? It pissed me off. And I was just up at night thinking, well, I felt really guilty, frankly. I felt really guilty that I had this outpouring and I still do. I, I, I struggle with that, which sounds like such a, you know, first world problem, right? That, oh, I'm, I feel so bad. Everybody's so supportive of me, you know, it's, but, but I do, you know, because I feel so, because my family has been so nothing but supportive. I haven't received any pushback and they've just allowed me to do this, even though I'm sure it's been painful for them at times, mm-hmm. but they have put my pain front and center because this happened to me because I was removed from my Indian mother, because I was removed from my country and my culture and my heritage. I had my roots severed and they know that I love them. They know that none of this affects that, that affects how I feel about them. So basically, you know, Dear Adoption came to me in the middle of the night and I thought I'm going to create a space for adopted people. And I'm not the first one to do this. Um, I, I, I didn't know about any, honestly, at the time. Now I know, I mean, there's so many, I mean, there's so many incredible spaces for adopted people and so many people doing such good work who really have laid the foundation for what Dear Adoption now, you know, stands on. Um, Because there's other people who were brave, 
who were really talking about this and creating space for adoptees way before anybody, you know, was willing to listen. And, you know, I think they probably received a lot of resistance and, um, and I still do with your adoption. I still receive pushback. I, I get a lot of emails from adoptive parents at Frank, uh, you know, I hate to call people out, but, but truly, um, I get a lot of emails from adoptive parents saying, what are you doing? Why are you allowing such hate and vitriol on your site? And I just, you know, I, well, now I don't respond at all. So just so you know, if anybody's listening, if you send me that kind of email, it gets deleted. Um, I used to respond though. And I used to say, I, I'm not intending to spew hate or vitriol. That's not what this is. You're not listening. Mm-hmm. Um, this is this person's story. This is, um, you know, someone who is pouring out their heart and you're not listening. A- anyway, I just realized I was beating a dead horse. It wasn't, it wasn't making an impact. It wasn't delivering. I would get more and more emails and responses and it was just irritating because we need to just listen. Even, even me, I need to sit down and just listen to other adopted people. It, it, it's so important. And Dear Adoption was born of Calcutta as my mother. Because I got this outpouring of support and so much positive feedback uh, on one side, and on the other side, I'm getting all these emails from adopted people saying, why, why are you getting this? And we're not. And, and, and nobody's listening. And so I thought, well, I, I just have to do this. I have to create a space. And, you know, Dear Adoption has been really, really successful in that adopted people have been sharing. And I think for the most part have been well received. And, you know, to people who don't like Dear Adoption, I, I get people saying, why don't you share any happy stories? And I always say, I share what I receive. Literally, uh, we've never turned anyone away. We share every story, story that we receive. And I'm really, really proud of that. But I will continue to share what I receive. And what I would say to people who are frustrated with your adoption, first, I would say, I don't think you're listening properly. Um, and you need to really lay down your defenses and your concept of what adoption is and your ideas or how adoption has even impacted you as an adopted person, possibly. But if you don't like what's happening at your adoption, you don't need to click. You don't need to come there. Um, it's a safe space for adopted people to share their stories, and I will keep allowing them to do that. And if you don't like it, then that's fair. Fair enough. Go somewhere else. Yes. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. And I don't mean it. Yeah, exactly. I don't mean it rudely. You know, that's fair. Go, go somewhere else. You can, you know, we all have different opinions. And if you want to learn, then you would spend some time at your adoption. Mm-hmm. If you truly are for the adopted person, and if you truly are for ethics in adoption, then you would listen. And if you're not, see ya. There's plenty of, there's, there's more spaces than not on the internet for you. There's, there are definitely a lot of great places for them to get <laughs> high-fived and feel good about themselves. For you sure. want to go ahead and plug those, Haley? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I will not be plugging those. <laughs> but I do want to ask you, um, going back to coming home from Calcutta, filming the documentary, and you already have your daughter at that point. And so how have you tried to pass on your, can I say that, like newly found Indian culture then to your daughter? Well, you know, what's interesting is I I really struggle with, you know, as I said, I really struggle with feeling Indian and acknowledging that I am and, and, and frankly, giving myself permission to be Indian. Well, you be, you said before, like, oh, is this cultural appropriation? Like, so that's, that's a fear that you have. Right. Exactly. And I think, again, I don't even know. I don't even know the answer to the question, but I think that maybe an Indian person would never worry about appropriating Indian culture. <laughs> You know, because I, I, I mean, I, I guess I'm not, I just, that's a really good aha moment for me right now, but probably most Indian people don't worry about appropriate, appropriating their own culture. I don't think that's a thing, Mm -hmm. but you know, for me, it's kind of a thing uh, as a transracial adoptee, it's a transracial Indian person thing, worrying about appropriating your own culture, which is really, I mean, we're laughing about it, but it is so sad. I mean, it's really, really sad because you just think, you know, that was ripped from me. And now I would do anything, you know, I'm just like, I'm grasping constantly to connect to that. And it's just really sad that it, it's, it's an issue for me. But the wonderful thing for me, and I feel like not to sound super, you know, cheesy or cliche, but life's gift to me in all of this is that my daughter, 
uh, Rubina, she's seven and a half, and she has no issues with embracing her Indianness. She is so proudly Indian, and many times a week, she will uh, confirm with me that she is, in fact, 50% Indian. Um, she wants to know the stats and the details on that. Well, if you're all Indian and daddy's, you know, then what's the other half of me? And we kind of tease because, you know, my husband is Irish and among other things, but we call her Indianish um, because, <laughs> you know, a combination of being Indian and Irish. But she loves India and Indian things the way I wish I had as a child. And the way I think really my parents wished, my dad kind of teased, you know, he, that she's like fulfilling all our you know, hopes in that way, because my parents really wanted me to stay connected to India. And I, I resisted it so, you know, emphatically. I really did not want to have anything to do with India as a child. I was, I, I think in a way I was angry with India. I think I was angry with India because I felt forsaken by India in some sense. India didn't want me. India didn't keep me. And I, I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And I didn't see how I fit into that in the, in my very, very white world. Uh, Rubina loves being Indian and she loves talking about it. She uh, often talks about, you know, she's has brown skin, but fair brown skin and often talks about how she wishes she were darker skinned because she wants to make sure people really know she's Indian, you know, and I was the opposite. I wanted, hated that I had such brown skin. And, and now, you know, while I feel that same way, I really, really want people to look at me and see me as an Indian person. And I'm starting to I mean, it makes me sound so unintelligent, but it's it's really an emotional, psychological, deeply rooted thing for me. I'm starting to grasp that people do. You know, I do have brown skin. There, you know, nobody else is looking at me thinking, "Look at that white woman. Is she trying to pose as an Indian?" <laughs> you know, nobody else is thinking that. But that's how I feel. You know, I feel like an imposter. I feel like I'm not really Indian. And then I have this gift of a little girl who is learning Indian dance and uh, listens to Indian music and reads Indian books in English, of course. Um, she wants to wear a bindi. She wants to dress up in her sari. She loves all these things about our culture. And I kind of tease, she came out of the womb loving the color gold, which is, you know, very Indian thing. A lot of Indians, you know, a lot of things in India are gold. And, you know, one year for Halloween, she said, I want to be the color gold. <laughs> and I was like, that just makes my Indian mama heart so proud you know, that she just, she loves gold and India and anything to do with that. So I feel like her love for India has healed something in me. Um, it really has. I, I'm really strong in my stance that I don't believe, you know, in this life, there is full healing for adopted people. Uh, once that fracture takes place, once we are removed um, unnaturally from our mothers, um, whose, you know, bodies housed us, right? Once that fracture takes place, I believe there can be many things taken, many steps, reunion, and getting to know someone, researching, even if you can't have physical reunion with your biological family, understanding your heritage and embracing those things, I think they can all bring some degree of healing. Rubina has brought some degree of healing, just her existence, just having a biological relative living that I know and I can see having myself mirrored in her. And on top of that, her love for India, I believe those things have really brought me a lot of healing, but, but the fracture doesn't go away. So it's a really wonderful thing for me. And I, I should also say, and I don't know, credit myself is the right way to say this, but she loves India because I bring that into our home. I mean, she didn't, I think, I do believe some of it is innate to her. There's something, it's like, maybe it skipped a generation. I don't know. <laughs> But it's like, she just gets it. She just, you know, and sometimes I, I teased her recently because I, I felt a little embarrassed that I feel like there's things she understands that I don't about India and Indian culture. And some of that may just be, you know, the openness of young minds, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that it's been a real, a, a real joy for me to get to see her embrace the culture and for us to do it together and to, to really learn together. And the things that I've brought into my home and, you know, the frequency with which we speak of India and Indian people, it, it really has an impact on her. But the way she has embraced it is really what the the sweet, you know, gift is for me. Mm -hmm. Have you let Rubina see Calcutta is my mother? Yes. 
the, I'm trying to think, about a year ago, I saw the first rough cut of the film. Kevin and I watched it together and we talked about having Rubina watch it with us. And we were just all home together when we got it and we were so excited. And she was really excited. She didn't, you know, children can't fully grasp something until they see it in front of them. And so I don't think she understood. She doesn't do, you know, a lot of documentary watching on her own time. So <laughs> she didn't really understand exactly, you know, what it was going to look like. So we did. We watched it together and we, you know, the three of us, we cried together when we watched it. And Kevin stayed home with Rubina while I was in India. And so he, he had heard all the things probably way too many times, but he, you know, to physically see what happened. And, um, you know, he knew how much I struggled and, but to see it was different. And, you know, the three of us, uh, we were still living in Denver at the time. Now we're in Seattle, but, you know, I can picture us. We sat on the couch together and kind of huddled up and we cried and it was really good for us. And, you know, Haley, you've got these two sweet boys and I know they know about adoption and, um, they know what you do. And it's a really interesting thing to be educating our children about adoption loss and trauma at such a young age. It's also as difficult with them in some ways as it is with, you know, our parents kind of are unfogging, right? Because Rubina knows my parents and loves them. And so I have to, you know, we kind of together, she has kind of learned with me how I have this longing for my Indian side. And I have this deep connectedness to my adopted side. And it's hard. But, you know, she asks about her Indian grandma. And the first time she did was really, you know, call me dumb. The first time I really realized the uh, significance of her losses. You know, she, she too has an Indian family. And um, I, I didn't share this before, but three months, you asked me about returning from Calcutta. And three months after I got back from Calcutta, my, my mom passed away. And that really added this kind of extra layer of grief as I was still really numb and just starting to figure out how I felt about my time in India. My mom passed away and I was very, very close to my mom. And um, Ruby was very close to my mom. And so I, it was in that first um, three months after my mom died. So, you know, six months after the film, after we filmed that Ruby and I both kind of started grieving my Indian mom and my mom who raised me. And it was a really unique thing for us to do together. You know, she was little enough that she was home with me at the time. She hadn't started school yet. And I remember we sat this one day and she was, she got emotional and said, you know, I miss Grammy, which is my mom. And I said, you know, I really, I miss her too. And I started crying and she said, and I also miss my Indian grandma, but I don't even know her. And I had this real struggle, and I still do, with, um, you know, grieving the two of them, with grieving this mother who raised me, who was this, you know, remarkable, you know, she was this remarkable, extraordinary person and, and mother. I just, you know, she wasn't perfect, but she was really wonderful. And I never felt um, any lack of connection to her other than just the knowledge that I, you know, was not biologically hers. And then also... It, in a way, it felt so much easier to grieve her because I knew her. But then I also kind of had this newly found grief over my country and my heritage and my Indian mother. And how do you grieve someone you don't know? How do you grieve someone who you aren't sure or not is grieving you? And, and people say that all the time. This is not a new concept. But, you know, grieving the living is so much more difficult and, you know, I, I'm sure you've, you've had this said to you many times, too. People say, well, of, of course, a mother could never forget her child. Um, you know, of course, she thinks of you every day. And, you know, the reality is we don't know that. And, and even if I did know that, it's not the same as sitting with her and hearing that from her. But, you know, she's, she's likely out of reach for me uh, forever. And when you kind of realize you have to grieve that, it, it's difficult. And um, so to be able to kind of do that with my daughter, uh, my little girl, and, and, and also, you know, being sure as uh, not to burden her with my burdens. And, and really, and truly, I mean, these things have really come from her. It's, it's been incredible. And I think, you know, that's why I say it's like this gift to me. I don't I have like this in-house little culture hotspot with her, you know, and she's, <laughs> she, she's just embracing it. And, mm -hmm. and she gets even at such a young age that, that we have a family to grieve. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Well, you got me crying too. Um, <laughs> good job. It's, uh, yeah. Okay. God, you know, every time we talk about grief on the show, something just cracks open and I just, I don't know. There's something there. Yeah. Um, okay. I guess I may need to make an appointment with my uh, psychologist. <laughs> Anywho, um, okay, before we wrap up, I want to ask you, now you're, I don't know if you're going to categorize yourself like this, but I'm going to, you're a public figure in adoptee land, and especially now that you, uh, the documentary is coming out, it will already be, um, have premiered when um, this is released, and you've got things coming up, more showings of it, and speaking engagements, et cetera. Um, but it started somewhere for you. You started writing about it, but what would you say to other adoptees who don't necessarily have the public platform that you've built? What would you say to them about sharing their experiences and, um, the importance of that? I would say to just keep doing it. I would say, keep plugging away. I would say be prepared for resistance. I think that when you are writing and sharing as you're coming out of the fog, you um, are very easily influenced. And I think that if I could kind of go back and do this again, which of course, you know, wouldn't have the same result, right? Mm -hmm. Had I known anything going in. But I think that, not that I have necessarily any great wisdom to impart. But if I were going to say one thing, I think I would encourage people to be so honest, um, even painfully so, and anticipate that some people may push back a little bit. But I think it's just worth it to go all in. I think that it is one of the scariest, most vulnerable things to really be honest about our innermost thoughts. I think especially in adoption where there's this really false narrative out there that people have, you know, clung to and are really having a hard time, you know, pulling back from, I think it's just really important to just be honest and know that you're going to get pushed back. But I think it's just really important to keep trudging through it and, you know, to lean on the community. But I, I also will just say, if you're going to write about adoption, if you're going to speak about adoption and you're coming out of the fog and you're just beginning to do some of these things, Honestly, I would say get um, an adoptee competent therapist. I just started last year um, for the first time. I found an incredible therapist who is also a transracial adoptee. Um, I would recommend that for transracial adoptees um, or, again, at least someone who kind of understands the uh, and recognizes and acknowledge, acknowledges adoptee trauma. I think that really would have significantly changed my processing of it. Mm. I think it would have really played a, a key role. So, yeah, I think though, just I just think you know you have to just keep going. You just have to keep keep doing it and keep pushing. And people are going to say and react however you know they want, but it, it's important. It's important. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Well said. Well, this is this is like the adoptees on time machine now. Okay, so same interview, <laughs> but we're like a couple weeks ahead now. Um, and your premiere's already happened. So I want you to tell us all about it. Oh, the premiere really went so well. I can't have imagined it going better um, than it went. It was a really bizarre experience, to tell you the truth. But um, it was really, it felt really good at the same time, but definitely bizarre. I mean, there's just no way around being in a room full of, you know, 230 people watching your film. You know, this is nearly four years, well, uh, you know, four years in the making because we had started the process, um, you know, long before we actually put the initial trailer out. So yeah, it's, um, it was really interesting. And I thought I would feel kind of a sense of relief, like an exhale that I've been holding my breath for about four years. And and it felt like maybe at the premiere, I would be able to exhale or in the days following and I haven't exhaled yet. So I don't know. I don't know if that ever comes. I might need to consult an expert or something, but you know, it's just a, it's a weird feeling. I think that um, at the premiere, 
everything went so quickly. You know, we got there to kind of set up a couple of things. And then, you know, within minutes, you know, I'm seeing people from my childhood, um, old neighbors of mine, uh, people from every church I've ever attended, every school I've ever attended. Uh, One of the leaders from a mission trip that I was on when I was 14 came. I haven't seen her since, you know, that time. It was also, I feel like I need to confess that it was a mission trip in Hawaii (laughs) because (laughs) I know how to do mission work. (laughs) But Anyway, so we did work. We did work. We worked really hard, but we were also, you know, on Maui. So anyway, but I got to see her and that was really a neat experience after, you know, 25 years. And then, you know, all my family was there, um, cousins and aunts and uncles, of course, my dad and brothers, my in-laws were there. And it was really, you know, it was a really nice feeling to see everyone, but also just so I mean, I just, I'm just going to be redundant and keep saying the word bizarre because I feel like there isn't <laughs> anything else that could, you know, really describe the, the event, but it was good, good, bizarre. Good bizarre. Um, I don't well, know cause I, it, you're, you, I don't know. You're going to say this. You're too modest, but like it was sold out. That's amazing to get over 200 people to come to something like that. Um, it's a huge accomplishment. You were on TV the morning before promoting it. Like, come on. Don't be too humble. That's like a huge accomplishment. I, okay, Haley, <laughs> reel it in. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I appreciate that. Thank you for saying those things. I wasn't going to mention any of those things, um, but I, I appreciate that. It, it, it is, and I can acknowledge that. You know, I kind of keep saying there's two, well, I say this frankly a lot in adoption that there's two parts of me, but regarding the film, there is, you know, producer Reshma who, you know, does what's for the best of the film. Um, you know, the film's money is separate from everything. You know, we're not profiting from this. Everything that we, you know, make on ticket sales goes in to fund the next screening. Um, I'm not, you know, lining my pockets. We're, and plus, you know, it should also be said, we raise the money for the film on Kickstarter, but also Michael and I have put in a lot of our own money to, to make this happen, which we're happy to do. That's not a complaint and not something that I, you know, we need a pat on the back for, but just to say, I like to be really clear, um, especially in adoption land, that this is not, you know, something where we're trying to, you know, certainly not a get rich quick scheme. So <laughs> that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, it's like the worst way to make money possible. It really yeah. is. So yeah. we're bleeding <laughs> money, but um, but that's OK. You know, we're really grateful for um, the people who've been so generous with their money and with their time. And um, for us, we just we we see a lot of value in putting this film out there. So it's really worth it to us. And, but I just did want to clarify that. Yeah, <laughs> Michael and I got to go on Portland's morning show on Friday AM Northwest. It's a show I grew up watching with my mom. And um, it was really a cool experience. It was really fun. Michael and his wife flew in from Dallas. Michael's the director, of course. And um, they flew in from Dallas. And the studio, um, the KA2U new studio, they gave the girls a full tour, our daughters. They got to do the weather you know, all the things they got to meet the meteor- meteorologist. Did I say that correctly? Yes. And they just had the greatest time. And we did too. We felt like it went really well and we were really well received. And then, yeah, we had, we sold out on Friday, uh, the night before, and we had hoped we would sell out, but yeah, it was a really exciting feeling to know that we could pack that theater. And Okay. Um, so cool. you're, so you're in the theater, it's packed. What happens? So I'm in the theater, everybody start, they start dimming the lights <laughs> and, um, you know, our host was a really good, is a really good friend of Kevin's and mine, Kevin's best friend, in fact, and he kind of hosted the event so that we didn't have to, it was wonderful. And, you know, I'd given him a really strict timeline and all of a sudden he's up there, you know, and it's like, oh my goodness, it's three o'clock, it's time. So it was out of body, <laughs> you know, to be sitting there again, just the culmination of events, you know, that has led us here after all this time. Michael was sitting in front of me. I was sitting next to Kevin. Michael and his wife were sitting in front of us. And I kind of reached forward and grabbed his shoulders. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is happening. Like it's happening now. And I kept trying to figure out, am I here? You know, am I in? I'm not, I don't feel in my body. Um, And so I felt really vulnerable and exposed because I was, you know, I, I really did not hold back in the making of the film. Every feeling and thought that popped in my head, I said on camera. And so those things were shared. And a lot of people have kind of followed my journey, but didn't have, you know, insight into my inner thoughts. Right. And so those were out there. 
And it was weird. I didn't think, so I told a lot of people before, I won't be able to sit in there and watch the film. There's just no way that I can sit in a room full of people and watch this. I'll leave. And I, I am, imagined myself sitting in the lobby and just kind of waiting and popping my head back in here and there. But I actually stayed. Uh, in the very end, I, I left for a couple of minutes. There's kind of an emotional scene. And um, I did leave for about two minutes. But for the most part, I sat and, and watched. And I, I was really pleased with the response. People laughed more than I thought they would, which is really good because <laughs> I have been so worried. And I've told you that this is the most depressing film. <laughs> and so it isn't. I mean, not the most depressing film, but you know, it documents the journey of an adopted person out of the fog. And that's a really scary, can be a very sad, really difficult journey. And so it isn't that, I, I, I mean, I'm, kind of, I'm teasing, of course, that I think it's the most depressing film. It isn't. It's really enlightening. But um, people laughed a lot and that felt good. People cried a lot. And that felt good too, because I felt like, the message was conveyed. I felt like people can understand um, how I was feeling as I was, you know, navigating all of these things in Calcutta. You know, they essentially went on this journey with me in Calcutta. And um, so that felt really good. My, my biggest concern going in was that, that everything was taken with a spirit with which it was said, right? And so there are times, you know, that I talk about kind of longing for my Indian mother. And that was a new feeling. That wasn't something I had really felt, I guess, I, I guess maybe in an obscure way I had been longing for her. Um, obviously I was longing for my country and didn't, I didn't really see that that was longing for my Indian mother disguised as something else, um, this longing for cultural connection. And so uh, of course we feel like we have to defend everything we say uh, adopted people. So it feels like, well, just because I'm longing for her doesn't mean I don't love my family. And I really wanted to be sure that message was conveyed. And actually, it's funny because people kind of give me a hard time and say, you know, you go so above and beyond trying to make that point that we're actually getting a little tired of how much you love your family. So, <laughs> you know, so good. And I'm actually happy. I'm happy to be on that side of it, frankly. <laughs> but the people who I, I really, the response, um, I was really the most interested in the response from my family, from my dad and my brothers, at most, you know, more, more specifically. And then um, also had they seen any of it? No, they okay. had only seen the trailer. Okay. So I offered them a preview. Actually, if Michael's listening to this, he doesn't know that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I had told my dad and brothers, if you feel like you need to see it before you watch it in a theater full of people, I'll make that happen because it's really sensitive, obviously, to our family. Um, and they said no. Well, that's my dad said no on behalf of them. My brothers really would have liked to. But <laughs> I said that my dad would make the ruling. Um, and my dad said no, that he wanted to see it in the theater for the first time. So, so it was a, it was a lot for them to, to see that. And, um, I imagine they're still processing, but I was, you know, most concerned about their response first and foremost. And they were so, I don't know, it, I, I just, I couldn't have had a better response from them. They were so, um, they were really emotional. My brother teased, he said, I only cried once right from the start all the way through to the end. <laughs> so... It was, they were really sweet about it. And then the other group of people I was, you know, interested in their response was the other Indian adoptees. There were quite a few adoptees from my specific orphanage. And then, um, I, I mean, I think there was like somewhere between 12 to 15 Indian adoptees and about half of those came from IMH, my orphanage. And so they, sh you know, we share a similar story. And um, their response has also been really, really incredible. Um, and I... You know, I worried about that because in adoption land, it seems like a lot of times there's a couple of people out there telling their story at a time. And I am only telling mine. I'm only telling my feelings based on my experience. I'm not a representative. I am not a spokesperson. I would never want to speak on behalf of other uh, specifically transracial adopted people. And so that's not what I'm trying to do. I, so I really don't want to influence any adopted people's experiences um, who have gone back. Um, and I actually appreciated in the during the Q and A, an international adoptee from my orphanage um, actually stood up and she said she had gone to India and she had a very different experience than I did. And I was happy that she said that because I really think that's so important. I, I you know, I have, I'm not setting some kind of bar uh, to which anybody else needs to either you know lower themselves to or raise themselves to. Right? I just this was just my experience, and that's all it is. It is. Reshma's experience returning to Calcutta for the first time and Reshma's feelings surrounding that experience. It is not representative of the adoptee or transracial or Indian adoptee community at all. Wow. Okay. So you're 
doing the Q&A, what other questions were people having or were they just telling you like how they received the, the film? What was that like? The Q&A was interesting. Um, I really appreciated that anybody was willing to kind of stand up and say anything. Um, I received some really good questions. One of the first great questions came from a woman who had approached me in the intermission in between the, you know, after the film and before the Q&A and said that she's uh, currently waiting the arrival of her daughter from India. So I think she said she's within just a couple of months. And um, she's, yeah. So it was that, you know, that, uh, it, that always throws me off guard just a little. Some is just because there's just natural tension between adult adoptees and adoptive parents. And so, I, and, and I won't even get into all that because it's just such a nightmare. <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, so I always worry a little bit when I'm approached with that kind of information. But I, I will say, um, she said that she has been studying and researching for years, that she's been um, intentionally seeking out adult adoptee voices and adult adoptee websites and doing a lot of research. She said that um, regarding India, that this w- that the film was the most insightful for her. Um, and so I felt really good about that. Uh, that's, you know, what I'm hoping is that it will open people's eyes. And, you know, it isn't my job to encourage or discourage people from adopting. I'm just out here speaking truth about my situation and what I believe about adoption. But, you know, I long ago let go of this duty to get people to stop adopting or, or, or whatever. I think that um, when people know the truth, that there's the likely they'll do better and make choices based on that truth. But even just with my, my projects, it isn't my job to stop adoption. I just, I, I mean, that's a ridiculous assignment. And so anyway, so the, one of the first questions was from this gal who's, you know, waiting her daughter from India. And she said, how soon should adopted people know their whole story. And I just said, always, you know, I joked that people ask me a lot, well, when did you find out you were adopted? And it's like, well, as soon as I could see that all of my family were white, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty evident for me. There wasn't much, you know, hiding. I am not a late discovery adoptee. It would have been a you know really difficult thing to disguise. So I've always known, of course, my story kind of changes through the film from what my parents were told to what was reality. And that's, you know, not really, it certainly wasn't my parents' fault. But it it is, you know, industry professionals fault. I believe my orphanage ha- holds some responsibility there. And I believe that the adoption agency holds the bulk of responsibility there. Um, I think they just lied. So to make me a better story, right? More savable. So I appreciated that question. And what I, in general about the q and I don't necessarily need to go into all the questions, but what I appreciated was the privilege that I have, that I get to do this, that I get to go around the country and the world and present this documentary and then stand up and say what I believe um, and talk about my convictions about adoption. Again, not that it's my job or responsibility, but I feel like I have to really maximize this moment. This is just a brief moment in time, this film and this opportunity. And um, I have learned a lot and I think that knowledge needs to be shared. And I've learned it from other people. You know, I'm not just brilliant on my own. I mean, that's like really funny because I'm not at all brilliant, but I have learned and I have (laughs) listened. That's not true. Well, that's very kind, but I have learned and I have listened a lot over the last few years. And I think it's really important. Um, I'm thankful for the people who spoke up and shared those things with me. And now it's my time to kind of share those things with other people. So I think it was a great opportunity to say, to expand on my story a little bit. People had some follow-up questions about where am I now? Four years later, right? You know, the film ends and I'm just coming out of the fog and I'm really devastated by that turn of events. I didn't anticipate that. This did not go how I thought that it would go at all. So people had, you know, some really good follow-up questions about where am I today? How am I today? What are my relationships with my family like? Have I gone back to India again? Will I go back to India? You know, all of those kinds of things. And I just, I really appreciated the opportunity to, to, to answer those questions. And it feels like I think I'm guessing at some point there will be a an, a time where there's a screening that I won't have a and A after, and I think that'll be really hard. I think that I, for me, I needed that. I needed that opportunity to address the audience who just kind of went on this journey with me, and so I don't I don't know what that looks like. I mean, eventually people will be able to stream it in their homes, and obviously I won't be there for you know a <laughs> private Q and A on their couch. So, um, and that's a little bit more difficult for me to think about. Sure, because you can't 
get in there and be like, and just so you know, I do still love my adoptive family. <laughs> You're going to have that in the credits like, oh, and also just let me right. just fill in. <laughs> yeah, In case you missed it. Exactly. All, all of my disclaimers. Exactly. Rashma yeah. de- Rashma is currently living happily in Seattle, Washington with her family. She does still love them and speak to them every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my so, gosh. Yeah. Brutal, brutal. Okay. So I, I know you felt vulnerable and exposed. And like, sorry to bring this up, but they did show a clip on the news. Um, I don't know if it's from the trailer or anyway, you're, you're walking in India and you have this like pink something and your back is so sweaty. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that, why, why would they do that to you? That's so mean. I can't believe they would do that. (laughs) Okay. This is hilarious. So that scene. Okay. Yes. It's very, very, very hot in India. And it's so funny because. I, the back sweat is like real. I mean, there is more sweat on my back than there isn't, right? Like it is so dark pink, that spot. And somebody asked me, um, somebody asked me after the film, is there any parts of the film that you don't like? And I said, uh, did you see the scene where Michael's filming me while I'm going up the stairs from behind? I don't like that scene. You know, (laughs) like, all these things. So yes, when I'm watching the film, what's so funny is, and maybe this is like a, a, a self-protection thing, but all I can see are the, you know, oh, my skin looks bad there. Oh my gosh, my, look, I can see a double chin or look at the back sweat or there's my butt, you know, <laughs> going upstairs. I don't know who thought that was a good angle. You know, <laughs> so yes, I appreciate you addressing the vulnerability on many levels. And uh, yeah, I, I would tell people, I think, I might prefer spilling my guts on screen again than, you know, having my gut shown. (laughs) Well, I just, I think that just for people to understand um, what it's taken you to come to a place where you can share all of these things and it's not just bearing your heart. It's also as a woman, how you feel about yourself and Mm -hmm. how you're portrayed that way. And then, I know you keep saying, I, I'm just sharing my own personal story, but for a lot of adoptees, they look up to you, they identify with you. And um, just, you know, we talked a little bit about this moments ago, but it was a couple weeks ago, <laughs> um, <laughs> just about sharing your story and how important it is, um, but that there's also a cost that goes along with that. And so now that you've you know, been out a week. And um, I looked at your Facebook page. People are like, love it. Everybody that's that went to see it, like some people came to your Facebook page just to tell you how much they loved it and how meaningful it was. How do you feel about that? The impact it's having, even though there is a cost to you, the impact that it's had for the people who have seen it and will see it. Well, I'll go back just a little bit where I, I love that question, Haley. That's a great question. Yeah, the, the it, it did it did come at a cost and it continues to come at a cost and some of not even all of that has hit yet. I haven't really experienced very much criticism. Um, for the most part, um, everything I've heard has been really positive feedback. We've heard a couple of you know constructive criticism things you know about the film, but uh, I mean I mean by a couple I literally mean two. And so the the film was done so beautifully and so well. Michael is just incredible. And it, it's really mind blowing, but. And and then really most of the feedback has been positive. And sure, is there are there is there a couple of people hiding somewhere who may have had you know negative feelings or didn't like it or something, and they're just you know being polite. Sure, that's fine and that's fair. But yeah, the the cost is the cost is great, and I think it will be ongoing. There's I appreciate what you said just about being a woman and putting myself out there. It's like, do I wish I lost forty five pounds before I filmed the movie? Yeah, <laughs> you know, do I wish I lost that same. 45 pounds that I seem to be holding on to, you know, before I went to the premiere. Yeah. You know, those are real things that we as women and, and frankly, especially for adopted people, because so much um, there's so much weight put on our uh, pun intended um, on our appearance. Right. And um, and how we view ourselves, because we're always looking for these mirrors. And so it's like, oh, you know, this physical part of me looks like that or, oh, my nose is big or my nose is small or, you know, whatever it is that, you know, we're constantly we have all these ties to our appearance because, you know, that's just such a huge part of who we are and a huge part of what we're missing. And so that for me will just be ongoing. And I ultimately just had to let it go to some degree. I'm not totally comfortable with it, with the back sweat and the 
bottom filling up the screen going upstairs. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, you haven't really seen your bottom until you've seen it on a movie theater screen. Going oh my upstairs. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's not ideal, but it, it really is kind of like a metaphor for this experience, right? I really, really, really spilled my guts and bled on that screen. I let people in so far that, you know, dangerously far, because people are going to have opinions about, about my opinions. People are going to have opinions about my feelings. And it's just ridiculous, right? Because none of us really should have opinions about those things. Um, none of us should voice, v- voice opinions about how someone else feels about their own experience. But we all do it. I mean, we're all guilty of it. And um, especially for adopted people, we really, you know, are heavily scrutinized on our response to adoption and that we should just be so grateful and, and all of that. And so anytime, you know, there's any kind of questioning or pushback, we're, you know, immediately labeled as angry or ungrateful, right? I think that the re- just, you know, the response has been really incredible. And, and I think, um, I, I really believe in the film, as you know, cheesy as that sounds, I really believe the response will continue to be for the most part, positive. I think that I, I really believe that people will see my vulnerability. And even if they don't agree with what I'm saying, or even if they think, well, gosh, that just seems so weird that she would feel that way. Um, I think that people will take it for what it is. Um, it felt that way. You know, what's interesting about that is I really thought that having the initial premiere would be like ripping off the bandaid and that you know, I would have that exhale, that sigh of relief, like, oh, okay, I can do this now. I can go on this screening tour. (laughs) What's funny is it dawned on me immediately after the screening. It's like I had no break. Immediately after the screening, I thought, well, this is literally the safest environment that I will ever be in showing this film. Like I could not be safer. There could not be more buffers around me, right? My family who love me, um, my extended family who love me, my family and friends, uh, Michael's family and friends, um, and all of those people, it was really the safest we could be. And so now I'm a whole new different kind of scared, <laughs> you know, going out to, to show this to strangers who don't know me, who don't know my background, who don't know my family um, and, and don't really have that that entire frame of reference. You know, they will really just see this snapshot. And of course, there were strangers there. There were people there who gave really positive feedback who didn't know me. A couple of people came up to me and said, oh, I just found this on the Internet the other day. And, um, you know, so we bought tickets. And so wow. there was, you know, a handful of people there, I don't know, probably 10 to 20 that we didn't know. And then, of course, some of Michael's family and friends also don't know me. And so there were people there who didn't know me and still had a really good response. But um, it's scary. And I think that it was naive in some sense for me to think that it would get less scary. Uh, I think that the fear of being seen and the vulnerability, both just physically and emotionally, and all of those things, that fear will continue. But I also think that I will learn to manage it better. We, I'm trying to think. So a year ago, New Year's, so 2017 going into 2018, um, we originally were going to release the film last fall. And so I knew it was going to come out in 2018. And then we just missed it by a couple of weeks because of dates and things. But I was terrified. Um, coming up on New Year's, um, coming into to 2018, because it was going to be the year the film would come out, right? And I couldn't breathe. I was like dreading New Year's, and I kept crying, and I kept thinking, I can't do that. I cannot do this. There, there's just no way. I've got to go back. What was I thinking? And so I've come a long way since then. And it it doesn't. It isn't easy, but it's getting easier. And I think that will just be an ongoing part. You know, our friend. Anne Heffron talks about writing the book. And she said, writing the book was so hard, but it's actually harder when you know people are reading the book, you know, because you doing the work is really, really hard. And it's an emotional process and this therapeutic thing that you have to go through and these really high highs and really low lows. And then you kind of think it's over, like I did it. But then other people, you know, other people who some are very kind and not judgmental and other people who aren't as kind and are very judgmental. All those people are going to to see this this work, and then you have to kind of deal with that. And so that's where I am right now. That's what's next is people are going to see this, and you know, I, I I wouldn't necessarily ask anybody to go easy on me. It is what it is, and people will react however they're going to react. I don't have any control over that. So it's really just up to me at this point to, you know, stand stand my ground in, in who I am, right and 
what other people, you know, there's that saying, what other people think of you is none of your business, which is like absurd. It's the most <laughs> absurd statement because uh, could anything be more difficult? And, you know, every once in a while you hear people say, like, I don't care what people think of me. And I think, yeah, right. That's all I think about. You know, it's just like all I think about constantly is what other people think of me and how I'm being perceived. And I, I, that's just a, something I'm going to have to keep learning to release and, and letting go. Well, thank you. I um, am so envious of those 200 plus people who got to see it. And so oh, I'm working on Canada. Yeah, yeah. Come on up. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rush. Thanks for sharing with us. And hopefully your vulnerability hangover will, uh, you know, lighten up a little bit. Yes, <laughs> vulnerability hangover. That's such a good way to put it. I just want to say too, uh, you know, on a personal note, I think you've been so incredibly supportive and encouraging. And um, over the weekend, I received texts and boxes from you and little notes just encouraging me. And um, it just really means a lot. It just to know that you were out there rooting for me and so far away it just, it just means a lot. So thank you. I, I got that from a, a lot of really wonderful support from friends all around. And it just, you know, really helped to sustain me. So thanks for that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and taking us through some of that journey with you. And um, of course, for recommended resources, I'm going to recommend that people go check out Calcutta is my mother. and. I know you've got the premiere will have finished and you've got um, some scheduled. Where can people find upcoming showings of it? Well, the crew, the production crew for Calcutta is my mother is still working out some of those details. Okay. But we do have um, following our Portland premiere, we will be dates are not solid yet, but they will be on our website, calcuttafilm.com, probably within the next few weeks following the airing of the show. Okay. So if people want to see upcoming dates and yes. follow along with um, everything that's happening, calcuttafilm.com is the place. Yes. And we'll be going right now. We have plans for Denver, Seattle, Dallas, Indiana, working on Minneapolis, working on a couple of um, Northeast locations and somewhere in Southern California. So, you know, we're ironing out those details. It's just a lot of work. I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay. That's great. Um, and then I have recommended your adoption before on the show. We talk about it a lot here because it's such an amazing resource. Um, but today I asked Resh's permission if I could read you um, this one example. Like if you haven't checked out Dear Adoption, you're going to definitely go after this because it's so powerful. There's a few different letters um, that you have on here that are from young people. Mm -hmm. And this, this one is called Dear Adoption. I wish I had her freckle. And it says this piece was submitted anonymously by a 12-year-old East Indian adoptee at a workshop hosted by Dear Adoption. I got adopted and moved to my new family when I was a baby. I do not remember my mom who had me, but I always have the same dream about me being a baby. And I can see her hand on my head and her hand has a freckle on her finger. I think that this is my memory coming into my dream. Sometimes I draw that freckle on my finger with a pen and pretend that I'm her and that I'm like her. I wish I had her freckle. I hope that when I grow up, I can be like her with my looks and everything, but I will not make the same mistake she made when she gave me away. Whew. <laughs> yeah, so really powerful and... um you know, this is almost full circle to when we're talking about at the beginning of the interview, you sitting with a young, you know, 10 year old who's processing the same grief as you as an adult. And um, that's just another piece of it. And to see it written out and to hear those words mm -hmm. uh, from a young person is just incredible. Agreed. Thank you for curating a space like that for us. Well, thanks for it. You've been so supportive and uh, wonderful to dear adoption. So I really appreciate it very much. It, it, it's, it's really what it is because people are willing to share as you were mm -hmm. just talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I'm really grateful for the people who are willing to share. Yes. And I, um, I wrote a piece for dear adoption. You got to scroll way back to find that, um, as I well, love a long it. time ago. <laughs> so do deep dive if you want to find that. Okay. Um, what did you want to recommend to us today? Um, I just have a couple I wanted to recommend. I know you and I both share a passion for preserving families and not separating them unnecessarily. 
Um, I really believe that adoption and family separation should happen as an absolute last resort. I, I do believe there are circumstances that may call for it. I believe they're uh, far uh, fewer than what we as a society um, engage in. So that's really important to me. Um, I started an, organiza an organization called Family Preservation 365 with my friend Stephanie. And we um, basically are just a resource site, um, an educational site, and just trying to spread awareness for adoption ethics, uh, the lack thereof, rather, and uh, providing tools and information and educating people so that they understand that really most families don't need to be separated, um, that there is a way to keep them together. So that is FP365. And the other one is an incredible resource that kind of blows my mind um, by another friend of mine, uh, Katie, and she has started uh, the Family Preservation Project. And the Family Preservation Project has a state-by-state -state resource guide for vulnerable women who are pregnant or, or single mothers. I mean, vulnerable or not. I, I really feel like all women when we're pregnant are vulnerable, married or single or, you know, in a difficult situation, whatever the circumstance. Pregnancy is a vulnerable time, which is why, you know, we've got to Inter, intercept these adoption agencies uh, preying on on people who are you know in these situations. So Family Preservation Project has a state by state resource guide, um, information for fathers, and it's it's vast and incredible. And Katie assembled this on her own. And if you um, go to her website and search your state, you can find resources and information that will blow your mind that most people don't even know are available. And mm -hmm. she found them all. So mm -hmm. I highly recommend it. And Resources can mean um, places to find financial support or yes. housing support or diapers or um, places to stay that are not affiliated with adoption agencies because a lot of <laughs> this is so sketchy. There's places <laughs> you can stay for free. Like we give you free rent and food and medical appointments. And at the end, goodbye. It's just like a baby and mother home and we take your baby. So, yep. but Katie has vetted all of these places. And so everything on there is a safe place for you to uh, go to if you're in that situation or to recommend to a friend who's in that situation. If you're in any of the Facebook groups <laughs> that are um, not necessarily adoptee related, but just adoption related, there's women that are going in there and, and looking for help. This is a great place to recommend. Yes. Um, they go, you can say, oh, go check out the Family Preservation Project. I bet you can find something near you that will be helpful to you. So exactly. Yeah. Rush is not exaggerating. It is extensive. <laughs> it, it, it is brilliant. And she, yeah. 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 Katie has a really brilliant mind in general. Um, she's a first mother. She's experienced this firsthand. And she has said if she had, you know, even an ounce of these resources available to her, she would not have lost her daughter. And mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it's remarkable what she's done in light of really what uh, has been done to her. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you so much for sharing those. And where can we connect with you online? Well, you can find me on Facebook, Reshma McClintock. Instagram, same. And um, I spend, you know, a lot of time there. And then um, I have my own rebuilding my personal website right now a little bit, but mostly, you know, social media is a great place to connect. So yeah. Perfect. Thanks so much. It was just an honor hearing your story uh, today and um, hearing from your heart. So I appreciate that so much. Well, I really appreciate you. And um, we are friends beyond adoption land. And I really appreciate the friendship, but just the work you're doing is incredible. I cannot tell you the number of times I've seen posts or shares of your show and people just saying that Adoptees On has changed their life. And I, I truly believe the work you're doing is life-changing and I'm so thankful for it. And I'm just in awe kind of of what you're able to do and uh, the far reach that you um, have managed. And it's just, it's really powerful. And um, I'm excited this year to see what's keeps happening with adoptees on. So thank you very much. Thank you. And just as you said before, we can't do this work without people willing to open up and share yes. um, from their hearts. Yes. 
Reshma and I are both speaking at conferences in April. If you would like to see Reshma speak, she is presenting at the Indiana Adoptee Network Conference. You can find out details about that over at indianaadopteenetwork.org. And she will also be screening her documentary, Calcutta is My Mother. And I will be speaking in Washington, D.C. at the American Adoption Congress Conference. And I would love to meet up with you there. If you're able to come, please let me know you're coming so we can make sure to say hi. And I will be posting details of a listener meetup over on the Adoptees On Facebook page. So make sure you're following that to find out details of where and when. But it will be sometime in the span of the conference, which is April 3rd to 6th, again in Washington, D.C. Would love to meet you there. AmericanAdoptionCongress.org has information about how to register. Thank you so much for supporting the show by listening every week. I would love it as a gift today. If you would consider sharing this show with just one other person that you know who is adopted and would benefit from hearing from adoptee voices just like theirs to, so they can know that they're not alone on this journey. Thanks so much for listening. Let's talk again next Friday. You're listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. (laughs) This This is is episode 100. This is episode (laughs) 1. Hundred. This is episode one hundred. <laughs> this is episode one hundred. You're listening to Adop- Adoptees On. You're listening to Adoptees On. Thanks for listening to my mommy's show.